Welcome to F in my Pagan Alphabet Challenge. F is for fairy tale and folklore. Um, so I thought we'd start looking at the definitions. Um, so folklore is defined as firstly the traditional beliefs, customs and stories of a community passed through the generations by word of mouth. Or um, kind of building on that 1.1, a body of popular myths or beliefs relating to a particular place, activity or group of people. Um, now a fairy tale is defined as a children's story about magical and imaginary beings and lands, a fairy story. What I would add to that is that usually fairy tales aid a child in understanding or growing. Um, however, they can also help adults in understanding and growing. And really, we each build our own fairy tales, I think, don't we? Um, so for many of us, actually, our first connection to witches came through the stories we read as children, for those of us not brought up in a witchy family. Um, I know Jessica the Story Witch mentioned Meg and Mog, who I adored as a child as well. Um, for me, Hansel and Gretel fascinated me um, so much, actually, that my mum, who was terrified of witches at the time, having had a very negative experience with one, um, she actually threw it away <laughs> because I was so fascinated by this witch. Um, and then the witches from Narnia as well were a very big thing for me. I adored the Narnia series. Um, I thought the Lady of the Green Kirtle, also known as Queen of the Underworld, was amazing. If anyone watched the BBC series, how epic was the lady who played the witches? Um, she played both the White Witch and the Lady of the Green Kirtle. Who dares destroy the silver chair? Epic. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine, and my best friend, met her. She happened to be like her friend's mum which is bonkers. Um, I think my best friend was probably quaking in her shoes because she was also very into the Narnia series and this woman was pretty scary as a witch. Um, so this connection also came through the folklore that we heard, that of the black dog who haunts the churchyard and of Gog and Magog, the giants who guard and protect the city of London. The more modern, uh, modern folklore even Sorry, I'm having a blah day today with talking. Um, so the Highgate Vampire in North London, where I lived as a child. Um, these tales are all initial connections to the craft. That's pretty English folklore there, really, isn't it? The Keepers of London, but it's just sort of, those were my initial ones, really. Um, we also have customs. So the folklore of throwing a penny in the well, so the spirit of the well would grant you a wish. The horn dance of Abbots Bromley, where six dancers carry antlers and are accompanied by Maid Marian of the Robin Hood folklore, a fool, a hobby horse and an archer. Um, that's pretty epic, really, isn't it? There, like the wild hunt feeling to that. Dancing the maypole, of course, the daisy divination of he loves me, he loves me not. All of these types of customs introduce us to spell work, ritual, ceremony, magic. Interestingly, Folklore is often passed down through fairy tale, and we see customs still alive today honoured in these stories. Um, beliefs are woven into the tales in ways that children can understand them. So even the understandings of psychology are woven in. As someone who's adopted, it's always fascinated me that fairy tales acknowledge the feelings of the primal wound that's created when one loses their family. Um, and that deep fear that's innate in children of losing their parents. I want to do a separate video um, on being adopted, potentially even a series, um, but we do see the evil stepmother and the orphan appearing very often in these tales. And what is interesting is that we seem to lose this understanding of the primal wound or push it to the wayside, as now many psychiatrists and psychologists don't seem to have a realistic understanding of adoption trauma. Yet there it is, woven into the fabric of our stories. Um, even the innate fears of something large, something unseen, something chasing us, um, they're all found and worked through within the stories. 
actually my son had a nightmare a couple of nights ago about the big bad wolf um and he he came downstairs to wake me which is really unusual because normally he calls from his bedroom upstairs and i'm a pretty light sleeper um so usually i would wake quickly but he thought it was running after him so he ran um these fears are in the fabric of us um you know they're they're built into us and we've molded tales around them in some cases to teach and explain there's an interesting offshoot here about something that does really interest me as well, which is our insistence that children cannot cope with dark tales or dark, you know. Um, these tales are a way of looking at the scary stuff, beginning to understand it and realise firstly that everyone has these fears and it's OK to have these fears. And secondly, you know, so they can begin to work through them in some way. Nightmares are supposed to happen. Now, in current Western society, many children um, don't have to deal with some of the things dealt with in fairy tales, certainly not on a frequent basis. So, for example, um, death is one that many children actually don't have to deal with for a very long time. I've known people who, you know, have only experienced a single death as a young adult, uh, not as a teenager, but as in like, you know, tw early 20s. Um, and that was a grandparent. Um, so, you know, rape as well um, is something that many, many children don't have to deal with. Um, and so it doesn't need to constantly be addressed through storytelling for those children. Although I think death really does, actually. Um, but, you know, for things like rape, where that child may not need to have it spelt out to them at a very early age, you know, that's much more dependent on you as a parent to make that decision and how you explain it, really, um, whether or not you leave it in a story or not. Um, however, as a parent, I have witnessed more extreme attempts to stop all scary things from being discussed. Now, I embrace the telling of tales to explain and work through those concepts, um, but a mother I know has banned all monster-related stuff. Um, yeah, child isn't really allowed access to it. And another uh, is discouraging fairy tales about sort of being taken captive. And you could say that that's something to do with the parents, you know, and their own fears. But you could also say that, you know, it's the dislike of watching your child be upset, basically, isn't it? But children can deal with much more than we think. And though we know our child and how much fear is too much, we should realise that these nightmares are healthy. And if we don't work through these fears, then they can grow. And when we're faced with them, we don't know how to respond. An interesting thing to look at is, you know, your own childhood dreams, particularly if they're repetitive or they've stayed with you. And what really was the fear in that nightmare that you had? Have you dealt with it? Is it still something that frightens you today? Um, I think that can be really, really fascinating. Um, and, you know, something that you can divine about and things as well. Get your tarot cards out and have a reading about it. It also brings up conversation um, when you read these fairy tales. So what do we discuss with our children or instead what do we believe ourselves if we don't have children for example there's a lot of good and evil characterized in fairy tales bruno bettelheim um, who's a child psychologist saw this as a way of of helping the child to make a choice will i be good or will i be evil um you know will i be a good person or a bad person however the issue comes, I think, when people are viewed as purely good and evil. So we can look at choices. Can we make good choices? Um, might those good choices still hurt someone? And can they still be called good? You see, it's just like, it's the same in magic, isn't it? Black magic and white magic. So if I do a spell to give my husband a promotion, then it might hurt the person he's going up against. If I 
do a spell to save the life of my child who's about to be hit by a car. But that means that the car crashes. I've still hurt someone. Was it good? Was it good or bad? You know, black or white doesn't really exist, does it? Um, and we have lots of discussions about people's experiences and emotions causing them to do things which may seem bad um, or perhaps may really hurt other people or even many people. Um, for example, some very young teenagers, I believe they're about 13, 12 and 13 or something, um, attacked an old lady near us. Uh, but can we call them bad? Does this help them? Does it help the rest of us? And can letting what we desire and thinking only of ourselves lead to bad choices, like in the case of Donald Trump or the Tory party in Britain? They're very, um, you know, based around, this is what I want and this is what I'm going to do. Um, and, you know, and perhaps the people closest to them, so certainly for the Tory party, uh, because they are a member um, of sort of higher society, if you like, so the richer people, um, their choices centre around the richer people because it benefits them and the people closest to them, you know. Um, so I think the answer to that one is yes, it can <laughs> cause bad, uh, you know, bad things to happen if you make choices based purely on yourself and what you want. That side, folklore and fairy tale is a wonderful place to look for teachings or inspiration in the craft. So something that fascinates me is comparing stories between cultures, so looking at the similarities and the differences between both. For example, it's amazing how many stories include witches and children conversing with trees. There's also a very interesting theme in folklore that runs through about witches being thrown into ovens um, or fires or throwing other things into them. So uh, there's a German story, I've forgotten the name of it, but within it, uh, I think it's called like Frau Trime or I can't remember. But um, anyway, the, the girl gets turned into a block of wood and thrown in the fire by the witch. As we compare these things, we can also learn the values that people both held in the past and hold today. And it can be interesting to see how tales change depending on when they are told and by whom. Learning the values and morals and the psychological ideas can be something we can really use as witches. And seeing the alterations and retellings helps us to remain discerning. I think being able to evaluate and discern is something very important in the craft. We must be able to sift through information and not simply follow instruction because a book tells us to. Um, but then I think that's also a really important thing to do in all life and something that is a really big problem in today's society. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is a good example of this change um, happening. So in the stories, uh, rather than the Disney film. She is one of six children, three boys and three girls. Her older sisters, much like in Cinderella, are cruel and um, they treat her like a servant. Now, initially, she's the daughter of a merchant um, who's lost his wealth, basically. But in the retelling by Villeneuve, um, it's instead discovered that at the end, she is in fact the daughter of a king and good fairy, um, which isn't the case in the original tale. And uh, he also adds extra magic to the castle, which is interesting. Now, for us witchy folk, in the original tale, we would find it quite interesting, I think, that Beauty is asked nightly by the beast if she'll marry him, and nightly she refuses, but she then dreams of a prince who pleads with her over her refusal. Um, so, you know, you can see there that in her dream, she is being given knowledge and it's about, you know, opening to that knowledge. We also see a magic mirror, much like in Snow White, which can be used to see what is happening elsewhere. 
So here, we can take inspiration from the magic in the tales, the dreams and the mirror that are still used and much discussed today. Many of you will know the tale of Bluebeard, particularly those inspired by feminism um, or by Jungian psychology. And in this, we see the enchanted key that will not stop bleeding. We see secrets, we see entrapment. Um, the use of keys in magic and fairy tale is still very prevalent. And it's interesting to see what these symbols mean to you. And the characters, I already mentioned Lady of the Green Kirtle, who has two sides to her, the one who rides above and the one who rules beneath. She also shapeshifts into a serpent, another key link to witchcraft in fairy tale and folklore. Now, another character um, who's always really drawn me in and fascinated me is the sea witch in The Little Mermaid tale. The Little Mermaid is actually on a quest for an immortal soul, which in the tale, mermaids do not have, but humans do. I'll read the description of the Little Mermaid's visit to the Sea Witch for you. And then the Little Mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the foaming whirlpools behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before. Neither flowers nor grass grew there, nothing but bare, grey, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water like foaming mill wheels whirled round everything it seized and cast it into the fathomless deep. Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools, the little mermaid was obliged to pass, to reach the dominions of the sea witch, and also, for a long distance, the only road lay right across a quantity of warm bubbling mire, called by the witch her turf moor. Beyond this stood her house, in the centre of a strange forest, in which all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea they seized upon and held fast, so that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still, and her heart beat with fear, and she was very nearly turning back. But she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long flowing hair round her head so that the polypi might not seize hold of it. She laid her hands together across her bosom, and then she darted forwards as a fish shoots through the water. Between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which were stretched out on either side of her, she saw that each held in its grasp something it had seized with its numerous little arms, as if they were iron bands. The white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and had sunk down into the deep waters. Skeletons of land animals, oars, rudders and chests of ships were lying tightly grasped by their clinging arms. Even a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled, and this seemed the most shocking of all to the little princess. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood where large fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly drab coloured bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house built with the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as people sometimes feed a canary with a piece of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom. I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way. And it goes on. Uh, then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught. Cleanliness is a good thing, said she, scouring the vessel with snakes, which she had tied together in a large knot. Then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into it. The steam that rose formed itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look upon them without fear. Every moment the witch threw something else into the vessel, and when it began to boil the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magic draught was ready, it looked like the clearest water. There, it is for you, said the witch. Then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she became dumb and would never again speak or sing. If the polypi should seize hold of you as you return through the woods, said the witch, throw over them a few drops of the potion. 
and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this, for the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught, which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. So isn't it interesting how the toad is included in this and the idea of feeding it from her mouth? And then these water snakes whom she calls her little chickens. We see in this a link to folklore as well. Certainly in England there is a lot of history and folklore surrounding witches and toads as well as snakes as there is in many cultures. We also see the spiral idea coming in with the whirlpools relating to this immortality that the witch has. Um, and, she, you know, she's got this access to it and the mermaid is seeking it. The plants are given that personality and just as trees often help witches and children, actually, in many tales or are portrayed as being dangerous and living. We see these plants, too, are given this dangerous personality that links to the witch. We see the potion making shapes in the steam and yet there's tricks to energy here for no one can look at them because they're so horrible. And so... The mermaid does not truly see what the draught will do. Of course, there is the cauldron she uses, and I adore her comment about cleanliness. How fantastic is that with the snakes? Then too, we see the blood magic from her breast that linked to life and new life, to feeding something. And we can't forget she lives among the bones of the dead. So despite her being truly wicked, I think it's a wonderful portrayal of witchcraft and it has so much folklore and legend woven into it. For those beginning, it can give a whole array of points to branch off from and look into. And now we have the internet at our fingertips. It doesn't take much to look up historical connections to these things, you know, looking up that connection between witch and toad or, um, or current witchcraft practices that use um, the symbols and things that you find, um, the types of magic, that blood magic. And for those who are already deep in the forest of their craft, there's so much to be found for inspiration or to give new ideas throughout the folklore and fairy tale. As an aside, looking at retellings and modern fairy tales or folklore can often be interesting too. Um, we we can kind of see what current society wishes to keep and which magic has stayed in deep connection to the witch in our minds. And we can even get new ideas or find a symbol we hadn't noticed because somehow this retelling um, connects better with us um, and, you know, it opens us up to understanding what that original symbol kind of meant. I particularly enjoyed The Witch of Duva, a Ravkin folktale by Lee Bardugo. Um, I'll post the link below, but it begins, There was a time when the woods near Duva ate girls. It's been many years since a child was taken. But still, on nights like these, when the wind comes cold from Sabaea, mothers hold their daughters tight and warn them not to stray too far from home. Be back before dark, they whisper, the trees are hungry tonight. And again, you see the dangerous trees there. I love the idea of taking these old ideas and putting them into practice. There's so much to be found in there. I definitely urge you to get out your childhood fairy tale book and have a look for some ideas in there. Or if you are a mum and dad, then you'll be familiar with the tales already. Um, how about robbing an apple in the dew in the morning of Beltane to bring in a beauty? Or more seasonally appropriately, perhaps, taking the folkloric tradition of making a corn dolly to give the spirit of a corn a home until the field grows again, and instead using a plant from your own garden or local area to do that with. Nettles, for example, could be a really good one if any are growing in your garden or local area. Perhaps we could tie ribbons onto the tree as an offering, like in Baba Yaga. Um, and also the old witch, which is an English fairy tale. I'm sure there's something to do with ribbons on trees and that. Could be wrong, but there's, yeah, lots of mentions of it. Our family have ribbons from Beltane to Samhain on one of our trees, which sits in the centre of, um, it, it's got like a little wall around it, and we've got half patio and half grass, and then a hedge and the back of the garden. And um, yeah, it sits in the middle of the patio, so it's quite a focal point for us, and we watch the seasons change on the tree. Um, and these ribbons are a gift to it, uh, as well as marking those, you know, more summery seasons up until um, Samhain when they're taken down. 
Have you tried scrying with a mirror, or as in one version of Snow White, housing a spirit in it, which I think is fantastic? Um, do you do anything already consciously inspired by folklore and fairy tale? I would love to know. Um, or anything that you're planning to do as well, do tell me. I'd find it fascinating. Right. Much love to you all, and I will be back very soon with another video. Huge apologies for the light. I don't know what's going on with it at the moment. It's very, very poor. Um, but I do have plans to set up a, a camera which will actually allow me to film good quality videos, which would be very exciting. Um, much love to you all. Bye, guys.